Good afternoon. Welcome back to the CHCI 2020 Tech Summit and our closing plenary, The Future of Work is Now. My name is Grisela Martinez and I'm Vice President of Government Relations at the National Association of Broadcasters. I'm also an alumnus of the CHCI internship program, which was an important gateway to public service for me and gave me a front row seat to working in Congress and with key leaders like the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. So I know firsthand how the support of sponsors enables CHCI to implement its mission of developing the next generation of Latino leaders. And so on behalf of CHCI, we thank Workday, Amazon, DoorDash, HP, Accenture, and ServiceNow for their generous support of this session. I have the distinct privilege today of introducing our panel host, Congressman Tony Cárdenas, and our moderator, Lisette Nieves. Congressman Cárdenas was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2013 and represents California's 29th district. He sits on the prestigious Energy and Commerce Committee, where he fights for hardworking families and has authored legislation to lower prescription drug prices, protect American consumers, combat climate change, and ensure that everyone has access to affordable quality health care. Having worked with him closely over many years, I can attest to his tireless passion on behalf of Latinos and other communities of color for equity, justice, and a shot at the American dream. Lisette Nieves is the president of the Fund for the City of New York, an institution charged with developing and helping to implement innovations in policy, programs, practices, and technology in order to advance the functioning of government and nonprofit organizations in New York City and beyond. Her areas of interest include community colleges, college pathways, workforce and education partnerships, and all of these are looked at in more depth in her co-authored new book, Working to Learn, Disrupting the Divide Between College and Career Pathways for Young People. So this is gonna be a very exciting panel. I think we're all looking forward to it. I encourage all of you who are watching to stay engaged in this discussion on social media uh, by using the hashtag CHCI Summit. And so without further delay, please welcome Congressman Tony Cardenas. Hi, I'm Congressman Tony Cardenas. I'm honored to be back at the CHCI Tech Summit Technology has and continues to develop at an impressive speed. It has provided enormous opportunity and it's important that we prepare our American workforce for these changes. Right now, we are in a second industrial revolution. Robotics, AI, and innovation in manufacturing has made the world more connected than ever before. It will shape the future economy and our social interactions. And if we don't prepare the American workforce for the jobs of the future, the jobs of today, people will be hurt and left behind. We've seen this with globalization in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We must not repeat that mistake. Currently, Latinos make up over 15% of the American manufacturing workforce. With major shifts on the horizon, it's vital that Latino workers in manufacturing have access to the educational and professional training opportunities necessary to adapt to future changes. We can't predict the future, but we can learn from the past. As industries change and develop, we must ensure that no one is left behind, that no American is left without a job. I am dedicated to expanding workforce training, access, and protecting the jobs of hardworking Americans as we navigate what is to come. A strong, diverse, and empowered workforce is the heart of the American economy. And I am inspired by all the brilliant leaders, experts, and policymakers dedicated to exploring solutions for our country's future. Understand that whatever your passion is, whether it's art or you love science, there is a place for you. And we are here to help you do it. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisette Nieves, as was mentioned earlier. I'd like to first thank Congressman Tony Galdenas for setting the tone for our panel discussion. And I wanna thank CHCI for providing a platform to discuss the future of technology and its impact on the Latino community. 
I think a few things are really exciting about this particular panel. We do not only have a level of expertise here, but we have those, so this a nice blend between what is the crisis that we're facing, but also what's the incredible opportunity that we're facing. And so we'll have a combination of those kinds of questions for a discussion here. Uh, with that, I'm so excited to get us started and get you to know who our panel is. Um, I also want to make sure that we hear from you, our audience. So please place your comments and questions in chat. You can also continue the conversation on social media, hashtag CHCI Summit. All right, now our panel of experts. I will start with first Mariana Santiago. She's the Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Workday. Hi, Mariana. Hi, said thank you for having me here today. Very excited about this panel and the conversation. And as you said, I represent Word Day. And I don't know if Word Day is familiar for everybody, but it's a leader provider in financials and human capital solutions in the cloud. So looking forward to our conversation. Wonderful, thank you. The next person I want to introduce is Nicole Francis Reynolds. Nicole is a Vice President and Head of Global Government Relations at ServiceNow. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for having us today, and thank you so much to Congressman Cardenas and the, the CHCI. On behalf of our CEO, Bill McDermott, and all of our over 13,000 employees at ServiceNow, uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to work with the CHCI, work with the Hispanic Caucus members, um, and to advance this whole notion of digital transformation so that we can make the world of work work better for people. Wonderful. And then our next panelist is Horacio Miranda. He's head of marketing for North America at HP. Hi, Horacio. Hey, Lisette. Good to see you today in this afternoon. I, I really look forward for our chat. We are very happy to continue supporting the CHCI charter. So looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful, wonderful. And the last person that I'm introducing is Enan, Espo uh, excuse me, Enan Espinoza. He's a senior manager, SNC talent and organization slash human potential at Accenture. Hi, Enan. You are mute, Enan. We can't hear your great voice. Oh, apologies. Hello, everyone. Hi, Lisette. Uh, good to connect with everyone. Happy to be here and discuss the future of work. Uh, I represent Accenture, um, and we're really excited to be here. We're one global team with 500,000 employees, um, and we essentially are here to help deliver on the promise of technology and human ingenuity. So excited to be part of the panel today. Thank you. Wonderful. So first of all, I'm excited to welcome the entire panel. When I think about us collectively, and even as a moderator, we represent close to a quarter of a million employees. Think about that, the representation just in this conversation. That's really powerful when you put it that way. I'm going to jump right into the first question. And this is for you, Horacio. I'd love you to answer this one. A 2015 report by McKinsey Global Institute found that more than 30% of U.S. workers will need to change jobs or upgrade their skills significantly by 2030. And this is in order to keep up with the pace of innovation. What, in your view, are some of the important soft and hard skills that need to be developed by workforce? Um, you think about in the workforce to successfully transition to work in 2030? And are there any skills that you can highlight of growing importance that, that have been accelerated by the context we're living in right now with the pandemic? Hey, Lisa, very good questions. And I, I have read that report. By the way, that report also mm -hmm. talked about, you know, the fourth industrial revolution. Congressman Cardenas was talking about it in, in the intro. So, you know, before the crisis, the fourth industrial revolution offered a lot of opportunities in terms of new advancements on how to use digital data science, 3D printing, other technologies that are going to help transform the manufacturing industry in a way democratizing manufacturing industry that I think is going to be a very big opportunity for, uh, for, for the U.S. Now, the crisis has brought some new challenges to us. OK, the rise of the digital first economy, the rise of the distributed workforce. So all of us, we are 
having to deal now with work from home and also learn from home. So all of these dynamics, I think, are presenting a new opportunity for a new entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial age for, for, for America. So in that context, we need to think about the new jobs, the hard skills, mm -hmm. and also the soft skills uh, yes. that are going to be important that are being accelerated now. OK, if you open LinkedIn and do a search, you're going to see that, you know, app developers, software developers, digi digital marketeers, data scientists, uh, data analysts are some of, of the new hot jobs that are in, in need for, for companies, small and big here in the US. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the soft skills, and sometimes we don't talk enough about it, this is something very important, uh, critical thinking, Complex problem solving, decision making are going to become more important. And also people skills, you know, working with others in this distributed environment are going to be some of, of, of the soft skills that are going to be in more need for all of our workers. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I would say those skills are not soft. I mean, I, I, they're all essential skills, aren't they? They're, they're quite essential. Mariana Santiago, I'd love to hear from you. What are your thoughts on the kinds of skills that are going to need be needed for 2030 and any kind of impact you've seen as a result of the current crisis on that? Yeah, certainly the, for me, the current crisis has accelerated some of the trends we have been seeing already. So if as, as Vice President of, of Product Management, uh, working very closely with our customers. When you look at what, what we have seen in the last 10 years, we had already seen in some type of acceleration in certain trends. And obviously, different type of work assignment, different, different type of work arrangement. Technology has the way people do certain work, and that's that they need to get new skills in many Reskill part of the work, upskilling them, as as it. But what with with the pandemic is that companies needed to be even more agile than than what we saw in the past. They needed to reallocate resources very quickly. They needed to make decisions uh, at a much pace, and that impacted obviously the workers. So technology introduces change but i also i also think it also introduces opportunities in the yeah. last two years or so a company for example what i have seen outside is we decided to help owners focusing on a better way to analyze skill gaps so one of the, we have not only kind of identifying list the hard soft skills that need developed but it's inventory of the skills for a company to say which skills are we on what are the ideas that that we have to analyze and if you don't have that inventory you cannot go to the next step and you cannot even mm -hmm. then do the, the the skill gap that you need so we started introducing uh, some new solutions leveraging machine learning technology that can uh, companies analyze the skills that are needed and also see what, how they can reskill and or upskill some of their employees. Looking at is also kind of see offer employee. So that technology is available. Certainly, for us, it was highlighting. Given that now we have this panel today technology. that means that a live continuous all all type of all different activities higher that on continuous learning developing new skills some of them are hard skills where it requires learning about technology but some others are more about collaboration and 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 things that were already present but now is collaboration in the digital space is a different type of skill. Teachers, we have seen all kind of needed to develop new skills nowadays, how they teach online. So all, all that, there's a huge opportunity. All that technology can help now our communities too. 
and I think that, that that's the part of the conversation that I think will will become very uh, relevant today. How we can apply technology that perhaps is already available in the private sector. How can we use part of that technology to help communities to put new plans in that opportunity? Gotcha. Thank you, Mariana. And I, and I, I, I really appreciated both you and Horacio's point. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Hi, I just want to say thank you, Mariana. I really appreciated your point, particularly about how you're leveraging AI to actually say what are the skills that we have that we require internally to actually build on the talent that we have here. And I appreciate Horacio on your point when you're bringing about that there's this level of soft skills that have to have a, a greater level of integration than we've had in the past. And, and the pandemic's only highlighted the need for that. And in some cases had a forcing function for us to do it faster, right? That making it that much more urgent. Um, I'm gonna go to our next question and um, Hanan, this one made me think of you. Said uh, when we think about the future of work, we often think about the areas that can benefit from disruption or innovation. And uh, and one area highlighted is this idea of the changing skills needed that Horacio or Mariana highlighted. Right, these changing skills, right. But you had mentioned in the past that there may actually need to be kind of some innovation or disruption in the process of reskilling itself. And Mariana touched on that too as well. Um, how would we do that? Can you highlight some examples of that kind of innovation or disruption of how we are reskilling? Absolutely. Uh, great question. And building upon what my peers have been sharing so far, uh, when one thinks about the definition of innovation, right, it comes from the Latin term innovare. And that means renewal. And in that root, it means to take something new and put it into something that is existing already. And with that in mind, we can use the new technologies that we're talking about today that are augmenting and automating how roles are executed to innovate and disrupt the workforce, to actually use those to pivot and make the workforce's future ready organizations. And this allows us to provide more opportunities for skilling and focus within digital literacy as a skill, communication, critical thinking, problem solving, and data analytics as something that's within the branch of reach for skills attainment. And so skills essentially are the new currency. And with that, if I sort of reflect and give an antidote, if we were in my abuelita's kitchen uh, and you know observing, uh, we would learn that there's a mix of ingredients that can be used to be able to pour out the right recipe for your favorite arroz con gandules or pasteles or sancocho, whatever your favorite Latin meal might be. And so that diversity of skill set is the way is essentially the taxonomy that allows skills to not be stagnant and helps us to start to use artificial intelligence and automation to help us have a living, breathing ecosystem around skills, which brings together the beautiful blend of human plus machine. So utilizing it as that it's not just a disruptor, it's actually an enabler and embracing that mindset is something that can help ex accelerate our skills efforts. And with that, one example is at Accenture, we refer it to new skilling, not just reskilling or upskilling. And with that aim, it's to provide workers with new skills to supplement their existing expertise rather than discredit or discount the, the skills that they already have. As we were talking a moment ago, the soft skills and the hard skills, bringing that breath, bringing that breath of experience and that diversity together. And we believe that a, a systematic change you know, is required by leaders across all sectors to help reframe the conversation on technology at work. And what we've done at Accenture is we've created apprentice models within the communities, working with uh, the community of, uh, of colleges, um, working with our government partners to help essentially create those paths so that individuals um, can come in 
and gain these new skills and be reskilled at an accelerated rate, but leveraging technology and the breadth of technology to help do that. No, I love that. I love that. And we're going to get to talk more about partnerships and building on that too. Um, I'm excited again, because we, we have read so much and Horacio, I'm going to go to you. We've read so much about how many jobs are going to be lost, right? We've talked about, and people can disagree on how many jobs are going to be lost, but, but this piece around how are we thinking about reskilling is I think where we have some optimism and inspiration from your perspective, what are some examples out there of where you're seeing that the same way he non yeah. offered some examples? Yeah, I, I wanted to share an example on, on our company in HP. Um, uh, we have a new role of a chief transformation officer mm -hmm. reporting to the CEO, right? So it's right there uh, on, the, on the decision making table. And part of that role is to define not only what business we are going to go after in the future, but then what is that transformation, not only in terms of tools, technology, operations, but the people uh, uh, agenda as well in terms of transforming and supporting our, our, our teams uh, in that transition. So Hernan, you mentioned that I think is a great example, digital literacy. So we launched a di digital literacy program mm -hmm. that is to really uh, level all employees across the entire company, regardless of your job, in terms of what are these big transformations coming up and what you need to know about digital technology. I think those are some, uh, good examples, Lisette, that requires not only the top down commitment uh, uh, from the leaders in an organization, but also fostering an environment where employees want to participate proactively in, in some of these yeah. initiatives that are gonna ultimately impact their lives. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Um, Mariana, in, in thinking about your work, it would, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about, because we know that technology is, you know, it's an inseparable element of the modern workplace, right? And I would always argue learning is inseparable from the workplace, right? Like just what does it mean to be an, a learner, right? That's, if there's anything we want, we want, we want hungry learners, right? That's a key part of this, right? Are there technology innovations that you uh, have used to build stronger and future workforce? Mariana, were you able to hear me? Yes, yeah, I'm touching on Chai earlier. Certainly, I can hear you, can you? Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I, as, as I, we, we were mentioning earlier, Lisa, um, there, there are technologies that can certainly help uh, in, in this new changing world of work. Um, certainly, what, the, the way of the workforce is are, are valid. So we are seeing more and more is you have to break down smaller pieces and you have to understand the skills that are once you understand the skills that are required certainly technology like machine learning can help identify mm -hmm. patterns and relationships and not different to when we buy something in amazon and you say hey because some people you buy these some other people have bought also these other things there are many correlations that you can also establish with the skills so the technology that we have right now, and, and Warday has been investing heavily in that area, where we can analyze all those skills, understand relationship between skills, mm -hmm. and, and understand what, what you need to perform certain activities, to work on certain projects, to work on certain opportunities. And, yeah. and then if you have also the skills of people, then you can compare and you can and you can say okay if you want to do this type of work you have this set of skills but you still need to get this other skill and in that way you can target developments can help different employee population to talk about a, a state or a, a locality or a city you can scale that to that level where you could be analyzing with the right data, gathering the right yeah. data from the corporations that could be in, in that area, you could analyze what are the 
skills that can be required and you could proactively plan for the workforce development initiatives that you could want to run to prepare the community to take on the new opportunities to the new jobs. I think of the, you are always on mode, trying to catch up of plan I don't that, but also for um, the different communities that, and obviously I think of the Latino community as being a key community that, that can get help and benefit from this type of workforce development initiatives. And the area of analyzing what the different kind of the different groups can need uh, analyzing diversity in a community and, and understanding what are the skills that they have and what is what they need to develop. That really mm -hmm. talk of potential I potentially the public private run to thy data. You need Great. to share that data, you have to analyze that data and you have to plan ahead. The technology is there, the technology is available. So on, uh, we, I have seen it working on the world side, many of our customers use the technology, both what we call kind of a skills cloud on our side and talent marketplace. So the technology is there, it can scale. I have a yeah. When thank you. When we think about this, and 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 what I am inspired about is that the critical role that Mariana you're saying in creating that taxonomy of skills that can inform the planning and scaling is where we should be leveraging AI as well, right? And coupling that then with what Elnan and Horacio are saying is that where we are doing it, who are we partnering with to have to make it happen? Right, that there's this, but this idea of scale is, is really important. It, it's the bound, there's less boundaries, it's much more porous, right? Thinking about talent now, right? Because we're able to do that. I, I'd love to hear you chime in, Nicole, a little bit about that. Look, we believe that digital transformation is here. Um, and what is critically important um, for us at ServiceNow is that we provide our future workforce with all the tools and resources and education that they need so that they can thrive in, in this, in what we call the future, the future of work, and we know that it's now. Um, and, and so uh, we also know that what businesses and cities and municipalities and governments, particularly the federal agencies need is, you know, a, a platform that can work cross-functionally across these complex systems that they have so that the employees can work much more efficiently and ultimately so that their customers, their um, constituents, uh, the residents can receive the critically important benefits that they need. And so that's why it's important that these partnerships um, join forces, that these public and private partnerships and universities and think tanks all join forces because the time is now. Um, really, we call it the future of work, um, but it's it's the future of work is here. So we should embrace it. Uh, we have a single cloud uh, based platform that works really cross-functionally. Um, and it, it again, our mm -hmm. mission is to make the world of work work better for people. And that's all people. Great. Thank you so much for that. The um... I'm going to go to another question while I while I have you, Nicole, and you're a, a panelist that that also focuses a lot on government relations. So I'd love to to hear a little bit more from you when you think about your current role and you're speaking in your current role. What's the role of intermediaries in accelerating training and efficiencies? How are how are you leveraging that? What are you seeing in this space? And, and that's a good question, Lizette. I think that it is very important to um, define what interme intermediaries are, and they are organizations that are focused on the employer and the employee. And public-private partnerships, um, joining forces mm -hmm. with these various organizations, just like the CACI, to identify talent, whether it's to develop 
you know, budding talent, if it's to identify the best and brightest that already have, have had the skill sets, um, that's what the role of an interme intermediary is. And, and so we look forward to working with the CHCI and, and members of Congress to address these needs. We know that there's a skills gap. And we, while we hear that it is hard to recruit and, and retain talent, we know that the talent is there. And oftentimes, communities of color need a, a hand, right? Need to know mm -hmm. about the opportunities, to need to know about the skills that are needed now, yeah. uh, not necessarily in the future, but now. You have to look at it um, kind of with a dual lens. What are the skills of the future that are needed and what are the skill sets that are, that are needed right now, especially since we are most of us are working from home um, and then there are others who are not working from home but have to embrace this digital transformation. How do we operate a robot, right? How do we code and create these new workflows and these new apps that mm -hmm. ServiceNow is working on so that uh, governments can function more efficiently and deliver services right. more efficiently and uh, companies can deliver their services uh, to their customers more efficiently. And so, uh, again, we look forward to working more closely with the CHCI and CBCI and, and so many others within Congress to identify policies and opportunities um, so that our federal agencies work much more efficiently, so that our workforce is trained and skilled and have the best and the, the best tools and resources that they need so that they're prepared and can literally hit the ground running. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Yeah, because I do think it's, it is this an interesting collaborative that's so necessary here, right? Who are the translators and the speakers and the connectors? And, and, they, and they come from a variety of places. And Hanan, you, you spoke a little bit about this, but I'd love you to hear from you on a little bit more on the partnerships that you've that you've built through Accenture that Nicole talked about, kind of the public-private partnerships. Can you highlight an example of that? Yes, I can. Thank you, Lisette. Um, considering um, our CEO is really sweet, really, I look at it from as a leadership and culture play. Um, every single transformation, if it's going to be effective to help our communities, um, really starts with leadership and culture. And from our CEO, Julie Sweet, down, we really look at it as we are serving our communities across the globe. There's one thing that is true of the people of Accenture is that we care deeply about what we do and the impact that we have with our clients and communities, because it's very personal to us um, with all the different initiatives that we've pulled together. And with that, we're committed to the communities where we live and we work. And we team very closely with our skilling partners, which include, as I was sharing earlier, the co community colleges, nonprofits, tech academies as key avenues to um, recruit our apprentices. And one of the motivating factors is that, you know, to us is that we started a, a pilot, which was employer-led apprenticeship in October of uh, 2016 here in Chicago. Um, where, and you know, the, we identified that there was a skill shortage um, that threatens our competitive as, yeah. an, as a nation. Yeah. And people um, are our country's greatest strength and the apprenticeship mm -hmm. program, particularly at the local level, can play a critical role in developing new sources of talent. And mm -hmm. so about a year ago, in, in, sorry, about a year into our own program, um, we found that uh, the Chicago Apprentice Network um, could also go virtual. So we started to be able to really help um, bring forth um, 725 apprentices in Chicago and even employ about 40 of them. And we're looking to grow that to a thousand apprentices um, across the organization and be able to pull them in, in, into our workplace. Um, really successful we're starting to bring this program to other cities um, across the nation uh, st louis uh, los angeles and a few other cities uh, that we're continuing to help from a diversity standpoint and we've made a commitment to be a to, as a leader in technology right we're, we're undertaking a suite of actions to help make our talent pool more diverse and so we're committed to increasing our representation of african-american Black, Hispanic American, Latinx, and people overall, including our managing directors and partners by 2025, where we'll help shift the African American and Black people, um, the representation from 9% to 12%, and our Hispanic American, Latinx population from 9.5% to 13%, which is a 60% increase overall. 
So really employer-led apprenticeship programs are helping. And as Mariana and, and Horacio and the team were talking earlier, utilizing technology to help accelerate um, the, pay, the pace of being able to get individuals skilled quickly is really going to be um, pivotal so that we can help um, people who might be really affected by COVID-19 right now and really being displaced. I would yeah. say that yeah. sort of in, in my role in Future of Work, um, we have received so many different um, businesses and partners and communities that have really reached out, governments that have reached out to say, how can we help ensure that we can reduce the impact of our community, or of, of our people um, being displaced in the workplace? And how can you help us with different capabilities to be able to respond and quickly um, to be able to meet that need? Yeah, and so, yeah. And so what's, uh, what's inspiring about that and in some of the the, the the things that you brought up, Horacio, is this idea that A, and what I'm hearing from Nicole, from Mariana, from Horacio, the urgency of not wasting talent, right? We have so much potential talent out there that we need to tap, right? So that's one. That's two, what I'm hearing from you is that we not only have to create a taxonomy, we have to do it fast. We have to have opportunities to train people in and think differently about that, right? No one here is saying, okay, everyone, we're just going to take PhD data scientists. We're going to wait for all of them to come to us and we're going to build the future of work, right? That No one is saying that here, though we love that too, right? As an academic, we love that too. We're actually talking about that there is this continuum of employment opportunities that can be leveraged with the use of technology. I would love to, to hear from you before we turn over to hearing from more of the audience, just can you give me some examples of concrete examples for that young person today where there is an example of a reskilling or a new skilling, a new way of thinking of a job that may not require five years of technology training? Can anybody give me an example of that? I can hey, talk to that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Great. Uh, okay, I'll have Horacio, then I'll have Hernan, and then anybody else join in. Because I think <laughs> what's going to be great for the people who are listening to us is that they they sense of what does the future look like yeah. and what does it mean right now? How can I place myself in the future? Because we're in a yeah. we're a little bit in a, in a crisis situation too. We're seeing people opting out of going to school. We want them to continue credentialing. So I'd love to hear, Horacio, why don't you start us out? Yeah, well, I wanted to provide an example. So I'm in marketing, so I, I have marketing mm -hmm. uh, at HP. So of course, right now, the hot jobs are digital marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Digital marketing reps. Mm -hmm. Well, what I wanted to share is you learn by doing. It's not like anybody was born knowing digital marketing. You learn by doing. So an invitation that I have, especially for young students, regardless of where they are studying, is to get to practice as, as fast as, po as possible, uh, whether that's on internships opportunities or, uh, or side gigs, uh, regardless of the size of the company or the project, it doesn't matter. What it matters is developing that skill, right? Learning how to put, uh, you know, ads in, in, in social media or how to do social media campaigns. Yeah. And what I have seen is today is that my younger employees are bringing the skills in. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the retraining is to happen with people right. that are older. So I think having that curiosity to learn and, uh, and fast uh, in, in whatever opportunity you have accessible is a very great opportunity for for young people Great. right now. Love it, love it, love it. That's right, right. How do you capitalize on the current interests of being digitally engaged, right? And you're saying that could lead yeah. to a career, which is exciting. Uh, Hennan, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've learned, we've built uh, different academies inter internally within Accenture, but also externally uh, with different partners and clients. And what we have found is that you can show uh, an individual sort of a path within three to six months to be able to get that skilling, to be able to move into a different role or even be more effective in their role. And even in some of the advanced paths of analytics or maybe cloud engineering or digital literacy. 
And so there was a an article earlier this year in the New York Times of one of the programs that we did uh, around reskilling America. And in this story, um, highlighted one of the programs that we did, there were individuals who had never learned how to code in their lives you know, but they, you know, were, were engineers and, and so on. And, and they took the opportunity to go get some of this skilling and are now have sort of changed their jobs. We've got these new quantitative engineers that we've got in play. It's sort of rechanging the emerging roles. And we've got individuals who within just a couple of weeks of some of our reskilling programs, they get called by their peers as oh now you're the dashboard person and they're not only they're not only doing it for their role but they're helping to teach others and that experimental experiential uh experience is happening and they're building communities and that is the transformation because you can't do it alone you need to have partners and so you start to build community of practices even within your workplace by having this space to be able to go out and experiment. And I'll throw one last one is, we've created an internal capstone program at different uh, companies, in, even within our own. And those capstones of 10 weeks or six weeks where people have done had a little bit of space, two to four hours a week of working on their learning or creating something really cool for the company, that drives innovation and that drives sort of that shift yeah. to say, wow, I I could really see myself doing this type of job each and every day and what else can we do and that really leads to that high high potential talent and, and that really leads to the career advancement yeah yeah and and the intentionality i'm hearing from both what you and horacio are saying and i also want to hear from nicole and mariana talking about specific examples in their companies of, of what is what is this kind of reskilling look like, right? Not necessarily thinking about it in the traditional way of someone has to have a, a PhD in data science or have to be an expert in coding. Where are the opportunities that have been leveraged? But what I love about Horacio I mean, and Hernan, what you just said was this, this idea of the culture you're talking about is this intentionality of curating curiosity right? Yes. That that's what we're going to need to keep doing to, to stay ahead. And we need to build on that. And Horacio, you talked about inherently capitalizing on the curiosity that in this case, young people already have digitally, right? Nicole, I'd love to hear from you. So a couple of things, and I, I want to highlight that um, ServiceNow is now the workflow partner of the NBA and the WNBA. And, and that is a result of the ingenuity and the creativity of our workforce um, to manage that bubble. You know, we were all waiting for, you know, the, the players to start playing again. And, and I know that we've wondered how, how did we, how did that happen? How was it that they were able to stay in this bubble um, without anything happening? And, and, it, and, it, and it resulted from the development of our, our workforce workplace, return to workplace apps and um, the ability to track, you know, through the, the monitoring of, of the testing. And, and so we have a fantastic apprenticeship program that is operated globally and we partner with universities and colleges and community colleges and we train the professors and the teachers with the curriculum that we have. And, and so they learn more and more about this cloud, the single cloud based uh, platform that we have and how it is um, able to, it's, it's versatile. So it's, it, it's able Able to transcend, you know, the old antiquated legacy systems that we know that still exist um, with a lot of uh, computer software, and and is able to work across all these different streams and able to build the bridge from IT to, to digital platforms. And so, what we love to tell our young people, um, and even those who are returning and, and learning more and getting reskilled, is that you can use creativity. And if you think about it, and I, I do this in my home now, you know, our mantra at Service Now is, you know, let's workflow it. How do we make the world of work work better for people? And I ask my children in the mornings, how can we make this morning routine work better for our household? Let's workflow this routine, right? And and so so let's let's use some creativity, right? And that's what young people young people are so creative, and and you're finding that even. The, 
you know, my parents are, are learning to become more creative in their thinking. And, and, you know, I was just telling my dad at Thanksgiving, instead of, you know, I had to learn how to cook everything because of, because of COVID, right? All the dishes. And so he was going to just sit down with me over the phone and, and tell me every dish and every ingredient. And then he wrote it down and, and, and he yeah. said, well, let's go over. And I said, oh, you can just text it to me, take a picture and text it to me. Let's workflow it. Right. And so, mm-hmm. and that's what we are doing. You'll see a commercial um, about Santa Claus um, that service now has and how Santa has to learn how to work much more efficiently and and transcend the old ways of of delivering presents to to families and so uh, we are just enjoying partnering with universities and colleges and apprenticeships are critically important now more than ever Um, and and you're absolutely right we need to uh, encourage credentialing and um, the app the creation of apps and coding and learning how to simplify um, our programs um, again are critically important well, thank you. I I want to make sure that I give Mariana a minute before we go to our open Q&A as well. Though, Nicole, I'm very inspired by all the future project managers that you are, are building in your family right now. Um, so, thank you for that. Mariana, you well, want to give us an, an yeah, example for sure. of that? For, for sure, I can share that. Obviously, several examples come to mind, uh, similar to what Nicole was saying and, and others. Um, Word Day has a program that is called Ear Up, and, and we work closely with universities. We bring young professionals, um, and, and suddenly they they get different type of skills, and, and, and obviously we, we try to then hire them uh, later on once, once they finish their studies. But Perhaps the example that I want to provide is a slightly different, um, Lisette, because one of the things that we also started doing at Word Day is posting through our talent marketplace, posting smaller opportunities, smaller opportunities that are visible to everybody. And then people can really say which ones they could be interested in, sometimes to develop new skills. And I think it was Horacio who was saying, sometimes you have to do something to learn, right? So there could be always kind of the learning opportunity, but also the hands-on opportunity. Um, and, and using talent marketplace and, and different teams, sometimes is marketing or pre-sales or, or development or product management, posting opportunities. And then you get people from different areas saying, I could be interested in doing that. Uh, I, I would love to develop that skill. Um, and, and that gives, it opens up opportunities that were not so visible before. It gives right. people more options too. And, and, and the work is broken down in those, those smaller pieces. Instead of being know. kind of the whole, let's say, product management yeah. job, is, is this project, is, is this type of skill that, that perhaps you can develop, is, is you break down the work in those smaller pieces. And we have seen very, very quickly, because I know we have to go to Q&A, customers during the pandemic, they needed to do that too. Where, for example, when retailers, uh, if they were not uh, in the essential kind of category, they needed to move more online and they needed to then offer opportunities to their employees uh, to say, do you want to perhaps work more on the distribution side? because now the the orders are being more online. Do you want to take this training, learn this? And it's a smaller kind of component of work. And they started doing that. And we had many customers taking that approach because they wanted to give opportunities to their employees. Well, but I, I love that too because your yours is it's that that wonderful equity lens is there too, right? Is saying that maybe people have to piecemeal at first, and then that's where we have a broad audience, right? And then they'll build on that. And the idea of doing that that's really inspiring, um, Mariana. Not that I saw you as a plant, but I was the founder of Year Up New York, so I'm very inspired that you use them as an example. <laughs> and I, you know, and I, and I think. It, that's an interesting one too, because again, students who aren't necessarily thinking about a traditional college pathway that are mixing apprenticeships and partnerships with nonprofits. And I think this is, there are a variety of different ways of capitalizing on talent out there. Now I get to That's turn right. to Q and A. Trust me, we have a lot of questions, so I'm going to pose a question, and it would be great if you could just kind of raise your hand, panelists, and I'll go to the first one. So, 
when we do that. So Joe is from New York, right? And he says, can you comment on the future of workplace learning for young people in higher ed, right? Like, is there something, Joe wants to know, is there an area that we should be focused on, particularly in higher ed? You know, wants to have a sense of that. So let's, you're speaking to all those college students out there, someone just thinking about going in there. What's an area? Go for it, Horacio. Uh, entrepreneurship. And, you know, we haven't talked a lot about the new techniques of learning. Mm. I think we started to touch on that, Hernan, Marianne, Nicole, but, you know, hackathons, like, you know, getting students together mm. for a weekend to solve real problems mm. for their communities and really getting those skills of collaboration, learning, solutioning, even app development in a 24, 24 hours. Those programs work great, and I wish they were happening across uh, the nation because it's a, a great way to get the uh, you know young people interested in solving problems that are real, and then getting those skills that are they are going to need, whether they they go and start their own business or they join a company. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. We have another said, great question. Yeah, go for it, Mariana. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to add what, what I have seen ha, uh, some of our higher ed customers doing is not, it's not only just the development opportunity and perhaps offering the hackathons. I, I, I always get amazed at how students come up with creative solutions uh, to things. But also I, I have seen um, many universities having also the student workers given opportunities to, to the students inside this, this, the institution where they can start doing some work for the institution. And it's that combination of not just taking kind of the development side and, and the training, but also working with the institution in a specific projects and getting that hands-on, first-hand type of learning. And, and I think students love that, by the way. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's, you know, Sometimes I think of it not always as a skills gap, but as an experience gap, right? What's the exposure gap, right? And you're talking about that there is a way of doing that too. Um, I, I would love to highlight for Joe too, an example that Nicole said earlier, which was that she talked about working closely with a higher ed institution and telling them about kind of the cloud computing that they're doing, right? So looking for higher ed institutions that have partnered to see themselves as pathways to, to building corporate talent like the folks that we have on this panel. Because there are some great examples of that too. Uh, are we ready for another question? We're doing it, okay. According to the US Census Bureau, immigrants make up 17% of the American workforce. What are employers doing to recruit, cultivate and retain immigrant talent? Hands up, who's going for it? Go for it, Mariana. And then I want to hear from you as well, Nicole. Great, that's perfect too, go for it. I think that more and more, um, first of all, companies, everybody, any organization, they need to understand diversity and inclusion and, and, and have the right analysis on right. from the recruiting side, but not only the recruiting side, then how you are promoting talent, how you are retaining talent, who are getting the opportunities, is the whole life cycle. It's not just doing the recruiting piece. In the past, perhaps Lisa said you, 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 you have seen that too, in the past, all the effort was kind of in, in the initial talent pool and getting the right diversity at that point. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. Is You have to no. follow the life cycle and kind of seeing that in every step of the way, you are given equal opportunity, that you are having the right representation of all kind of the diversity that, that you want to see in your organization. That when you have opportunities for promotion and, and development opportunities, that that diversity is represented there too. For that, you also have to have, again, the right data, the right analysis in place. Um, sometimes it's also a question of having best practices we, we did something at Wardy just recently that we call VIVE, is value, inclusion, belonging, and equity. And is mm. how do you analyze that data? What are those indexes that, that you have to be looking at to make sure that all along the way, you are having that belonging and diversity represented? So I, I think that is, is also 
a mindset um, that, that many organizations need to acquire because it's, if it's not part of the DNA of the company, you have to put for effort and, and conscious, conscious investment to make it happen. Absolutely. I love um, how you used VIBE as a lens, right? When you use that acronym, right? As a lens to yeah. make sure that equity is throughout the career pathway, right? I think that's an interesting exactly. one. And, and, I, and I think the urgency of now and thinking about the future of work, I want to highlight another piece you had, which is that we can't just think of the traditional beginning of the pipeline. There is no, the urgency requires us to look at a longer horizon and in a much larger diversity of talent in general and skills and people and all of that. Appreciate that. Nicole, how about you? Um, you know, ServiceNow is it's a global company. And what I love about my role is, as head of global government relations is that I get to talk to colleagues from all across the world. Um, and, you know, diversity, inclusion and belonging is implicit. Um, it is part of ServiceNow's culture. Um, it's part of our business practices and our strategies as we uh, retain and recruit and um, and retain and talent. And it's it's part of our leadership. Um, and, and I'm really fortunate uh, to work for such a great company. And everywhere you turn, it's it, we have just like a, a multicultural cross section of people from all over the world, and uh, and it takes people like us to reach back and recruit others, right? And to explain what our role is like and what the culture is like, and even in our recruiting practices, it's important that we include diverse candidates. And so it's it's just embedded in who we are and who, what our culture is all about. Right. I, I have a question from Yvette and. And I love getting the public questions because you, you see the range of where folks are coming from in, in this experience. And, and Yvette's saying, you know, where can we, where can she go to be part of this new skilling? What would be a next step for her? Are opportunities posted on websites? Is there a place you suggest that they, you know, an individual go to to start this journey? Horacio mentioned, you know, stay curious where you're at for some people in digital marketing. Are there other tips or suggestions for folks who are thinking about kind of reskilling or new skilling? Sure. I, I'd like to know, you know, and maybe we can get her information later, but where she lives, um, what city okay. she's in, and and perhaps there is a university that ServiceNow is working with where there's an apprenticeship program, or uh, perhaps we are hiring in the area where she is. And I know that we, you know, most of our employees, all of our employees, frankly, are working remotely, but I'd like to talk more and learn a little more about where she's located so that we can be helpful. That's great. That's great. Is that uh, it, Mariana? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think that, no. yeah, part, part of the challenge is today is that obviously cities and localities have not yet been able to make it as easy as it sounds with regards to exposing the opportunities. I think that yes. what can be done is, is certainly depending on, as Nicole is saying, depending on where you are and what you what, what are the things that you, that curiosity aspect, what you could be interested in, then sometimes I think that community um, and, and seeing what can be available. Um, suddenly corporations are trying now more and more to, to give other opportunities. So it, it will depend on interest, location, kind of all the variables combined that, that could give the information that, that is required. I wish, I honestly wish that um, now policymakers can also help with this, right? Kind of saying, how can we make that easier for communities? Mm -hmm. How can we make that information more easily available? So then it's, it's, it's not such a, such a, such a hassle to, to find it and, and, and to know what the next step could be. Yeah, yeah. And I would I would say this too, and this is why CHCI is convening this, that each of you have chosen to support this conference and be part of it because you believe in opportunity and seeking talent and building talent. So, you know, at the end of this, we could always just send information to CHCI and, we, and they could make sure that whoever attended knows the kinds of opportunities because I see questions are coming up 
I want to know more about the apprenticeship program at Accenture. I want to hear more about where Nicole is doing work with colleges. I want to hear more about what her does. So the, the beauty is that all of you have inspired um, the questions here. So it would be great that if we can collect some of some of those examples, which would be great for, as connections. Um, when we're thinking about another one here too, I have a couple of more questions that I'm going to go through. I see one more here, and the question is: If I, it's it's for that person, you know, how do we think about? Maybe it's more of a vision question. How do we think about rebuilding post a crisis in a way that leverages technology? Right? How do we think about that? Right? Uh, I'm I'm moderating from a city that has twice the level of national unemployment, right? We've seen tax revenues go down. We've seen that, right? There's this need for recovery is going to be quite strong in, in my home city, in New York, right? How, how might we think about leveraging technology to be part of that recovery? I mean, any of you can join in on that. I, I think what is, okay, go ahead, go ahead, man. Oh, sure. Um, so, we have started some work around that. Um, this is an initiative that was actually started by uh, CHROs and different community members, which was something known as um, People Plus Work Connect. So if you wanted to go right now, it's live, it lives, it's out there. And what that is, um, tr as people are getting displaced from, uh, um, from, from COVID and, and, and from a, a supply standpoint, there's other workers or, or sorry other companies out there who are available to help fill those jobs or help partner to help do that movement and we're having conversations truly with global companies um, that have uh, hundreds of thousands of employees um, you know with our work with the world economic forum in which they really are taking to heart um, very having very critical conversations about how do we help our communities so that we do not continue to displace individuals and, 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 and leave them without a path to be able to continue to work. And people are having yeah. very hard conversations about that at the higher levels, highest levels to try and do that. But that's one opportunity in which we're using technology to be able to help um, individuals uh, not just get completely displaced, but be able to put them into other locations or other work areas. Great. Thank Elisette, you for that. Something that, that I want yeah, Horacio, how about you? That yeah. I wanted to add is even though we, we were talking about technology, I mean, we are all here representing technology companies. You cannot start with technology. You need mm -hmm. to start with what problems are we trying to solve? And I think mm -hmm. COVID-19 has presented a lot of problems that we need to solve. Digital divide you know, just for students, you know, students not able to get educated at home if they don't have the technology. So I think we can get synergy around identifying those problems. Then we can see how we can apply technology to solve them, right? But I think that's something that I really recommend for people thinking about the future. What is that North Star? Is what are those challenges on our communities that we need to really solve uh, yeah. coming out of our learnings from the pandemic? Sure, sure. And there are, and that's a, and you know, Hernan's talking about, you know, how do we partner with others, as we say, supply and demand, right? How do we play a role yeah. in being that almost an intermediary that's in one? Mm -hmm. And you're saying there are other gatekeepers that happen just socioeconomically that are preventing people from being part of it. Would, would, would Nicole Mariana like to chime in also? Yes, I'd like to just add that, look, we know that this pandemic has caused us to accelerate how we use technology and really transform systems. And one of the um, the apps that um, ServiceNow was able to create and to assist with state governments is with unemployment. And think about how in the past, you know, unemployment recipient, your applicants would go in, right, to the unemployment offices and apply. Well, we couldn't, you know, the states couldn't wait um, and, and see how best to figure this out. And that's why I think that our cloud-based platform enabled uh, states to integrate our, our, the app for, for that, to create a much more seamless uh, transition. And now they're able to operate the un 
unemployment system much more efficiently, um, not only saving the state money, right, become, by becoming more efficiently efficient, but then also um, to enlarge in the tent. Think about how many um, employees were laid off or furloughed and had to apply for unemployment benefits. And through the power of technology, they were able to go online and apply, you know, hopefully seamlessly in, in these states where we've been able to operate. And we use the word streamline very carefully because it can oftentimes mean that people were shut out of this process. But we know and have the data and the customer success stories to, to show that uh, the processes were made much more efficient. And you can just think of other systems going to the DMV, right? Um, you know, having to workflow that and creating more efficient systems. And and so we won't, we won't come out of this pandemic doing some of the same things in the same ways that we did them before and because of technology. Yeah. And, and no, I, said, I, I would like to ex yeah. I would like to tap on onto something that Paul was saying. What if when when people apply for unemployment, what if we if we could capture their skills? And See, and then yeah. capturing their skills as, as opportunities come up, you can you can be in closer touch with them and help them with that next opportunity. So that's mm -hmm. how you can also close the loop, right? Is yeah, technology can help, but at the end of the day, technology serves a purpose and is trying to solve a problem, as, as Horacio well put it. And I think that if you can capture those skills and then you have the information with regards to what other opportunities and how you can help people who got unemployed, then okay. it becomes something that is actionable and, and, and it can help communities. Um, and, and that's what I feel could really open the door to many, many other options. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, well, thank you for that and 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 that visioning because I think we're at a time where we should we should be as bold with our ideas about the future, right? We should. I I we're actually at the time where we have to close out. So I have the tough job of saying to everyone, I would love to give you a minute for a closing statement. Um, and that's just a compliment to all of you because it was a really robust discussion. So um, how about we start with Nicole? Nicole. Thank you, Lisette. I just want to thank, again, um, you, Lisette, and the CHCI and Congressman Cardenas for allowing ServiceNow to be part of this um, critically important panel discussion about the future of work. And we look forward to working with the members of Congress and universities and mayors and governors um, as we do try to address this, this notion of this concept of digital transformation. And uh, we want to make sure that every community is part of this revolution revolution um, and embrace it in such a way that they are included and, and not left behind and that systems are uh, run in a much more efficient and effective way. Okay, thank you, Nicole. How about you, Hernan? Great. Thank you so much, Lisette, and for everyone putting together this event on the future of work. It is just one of the most critical discussions that we're having everywhere we go within our communities. And it's vitally important to ensure that we continue to have this conversation at, at the right levels and continue to think about the diversity um, of individuals that could be left behind in this fourth industrial revolution if we don't continue to drive change and have the conversation, but even drive that to outcomes. And I would recommend anyone who's looking to um, sort of has questions about trying to uh, get to redefine their career path or be or been displaced. Think about what your IQ is and in the sense of what is your interest? What are the core things that you've been doing amazing? And when you're really excited to do work and then whatever that is, start to frame that up and then connect into us so that we can try and see how we can help you connect and get back to work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Hanan. How about you, Mariana? Well, first of all, I want to thank the Hispanic Caucus Institute for the opportunity uh, to participate in this panel and for being a part of this amazing group uh, here on the call today. Um, I, I, I think that there is an opportunity here to help communities. I, I think that there is work that can be done, uh, putting technology to serve um, a, a bigger purpose, a bigger goal. And, and and obviously Latino community being one of them. Um, hopefully we can all help 
in making that happen. We, I think we all can play a role and, and certainly World Day is interested in, in playing that role. So looking forward to, to the future on this. Thank you, Mariana and Horacio. Haley said, well, I, I am very thankful for the dialogue today with my fellow uh, panelists. Uh, I think we touch on this need for collaboration, right? Public sector, private sector, universities, uh, community colleges. Mar uh, Mariana just talked about communities and I, I want to uh, provide the final link that is people, right? And I think, I hope uh, all people attending the event today got some inspiration, maybe some early points on how to go about it. But it requires that it requires uh, curiosity from everybody to, to, to really get into that journey to learning more. There's a lot of resources in online to, to get started. And I think that's the other pe people, right? Uh, change creates opportunity. And I think this pandemic will end up creating this new entrepreneurial age uh, for America that will be very exciting to see where we can take it next. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just want to say this as we close too. I just want to thank you all. I want to thank Mariana, Nicole, Horacio, Hernan for bringing yourselves, the talent, your organizations, your companies here. We appreciate all of that. And a couple of the takeaways real quick. One is that technology in itself is not what we're supposed to be talking about is about human driven. So I just want to thank you all for that. Good afternoon. I am Marco Davis, president and CEO of CHCI. I want to thank you, Lisette, for leading that extraordinary conversation with our experts and leaders on the future of work and the Latino workforce. You're a tremendous leader and a friend. And now thank you so much to our Tech Summit host sponsor, Amazon, for your generous support of this event and your continued commitment to CHCI. To our speakers and moderators, thank you for leading such insightful, engaging, and critical conversations throughout the day. Of course, I absolutely have to thank my colleagues on the CHCI team for all the heroic effort they put into planning, organizing, and executing this entire event. They have done all the heavy lifting and I'm so grateful for their exceptional commitment. And I wanna thank you all for taking the time to participate in our Tech Summit today. We truly appreciate your engagement and support and we hope you found the discussions informative. Let's continue these conversations as we all work together to advance Latino leadership, investment, access and participation in all areas of the tech sector. In the next few days, you will receive a brief recap of the discussions and access to sessions to watch on demand and share with your networks. The recap will include a short event survey. Please complete it to give us your feedback about the summit. It really makes a difference when we hear from you because it helps us plan future events like this. And on the subject of using technology, I want to take a minute to remind you to listen to the new CHCI podcast, Here to Lead. In it, we talk with Latino leaders about their journeys, keys to success, and how to develop the next generation of Latino leaders. Our guests so far have included outstanding leaders like Marcelo Claure, Oscar Munoz, Maria Contreras Sweet, and Pedro Pizarro. If any of those names aren't familiar, listen to the podcast and hear their story. You can find Here to Lead on all major podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. You can even ask Alexa and Siri to play the Here to Lead podcast. How's that for cutting edge? Now, as you know, CHCI's mission is to develop the next generation of Latino leaders through professional leadership programs and transformational experiences. We're so thankful for the generous support of our corporate partners to make that happen. We're already gearing up for 2021 and are accepting program applications right now at chci.org. Finally, I also want to invite you to join us tomorrow, December 9th, for our Congressional Staff Awards presentation. CHCI and the CHCI Alumni Association, in collaboration with the Congressional Hispanic Staff Association, CHASA, will honor two esteemed Congressional Senior Staff members for their dedication to advancing diversity on Capitol Hill and their role in cultivating opportunities for other emerging leaders, especially CHCI alumni. We'll be recognizing Marcia Espinosa, Chief of Staff for Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, and Jaime Lizarraga, Senior Advisor to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. You can watch the live stream of that event on our Facebook page at CHCIDC 
and the program starts at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you once again for all of your support today and throughout this past year. Please continue to engage and stay in touch with us on social media at CHCIDC. Most of all, I want to wish everyone a wonderful holiday season. We look forward to reconnecting in the new year. Stay safe and healthy. Buenas tardes.